I think this is probably one of the most interesting topics around. I really think so, because it applies to almost everything that you do, not just professionally, but to your entire life, the way you live your life, and uh, what sort of accomplishments you might then be able to make as you go along. There's common characteristics between creative people in every culture. And just as I did with leadership, just as I've done with religion, I've done a broad survey of what creativity actually looks like and made a note of all of the things that uh, seem to be common across cultures. And uh, that's what I'll be giving you today. You will, uh, if you so decide, and I absolutely encourage you to do this, totally encourage you to do it, it's probably one of the most valuable things you could possibly do for yourself, is to think about how you can adapt these ideas to your own life. You know, there's no one size fits all to be creative. It's simply describing an underlying mindset and then deciding how you personally are going to implement that. And, you know, I can guarantee you that you will become more creative if you do this. Okay, so uh, that's the first part of the lecture. The second part, we'll be looking at uh, the ethical side of um, technology. Very important sort of topic, uh, not one that most technologists give a whole lot of thought to, but nonetheless, a pretty important idea. All right, so first of all, let's... Uh, just briefly talk about where creativity comes from. You know, there, since the Enlightenment hundreds of years ago, it has been assumed that creativity comes from within, that it's something that a person generates from within and then expresses. In other words, they take ownership of that thing. It's theirs. Uh, but up until then, there was a whole... Uh, uh, an opposite view, which was the way the ancient Greeks thought about it, was that inspiration came from outside, from a divine source, they said, via these, these gods or demigods called muses, you know, the muse. And each of the branch of the arts had its own muse and the artist uh, would be inspired by the muse. But not just anybody would be inspired by the muse, it took discipline and dedication to actually receive that inspiration. And there's an old saying that genius or high creativity is basically nine-tenths perspiration or hard work and one-tenth inspiration. So you have to actually pave the way. You have to create the right conditions for it to occur. It takes self-discipline. Now, we don't have time to look at it today, but there's a link to this uh, video. This is probably um, the most, one of the most watched TED Talks of all times. This is Liz Gilbert. She is a best-selling novelist, and uh, she's talking about her creative process, and she's one of the most engaging speakers like this. So absolutely, if you don't watch any of the other videos on the course website, do watch this one because it's really very good. And, you know, what she says in there is basically, I don't think it comes from within me. It comes through me from somewhere else. And she talks, you know, she did a lot of talking to other uh, creative people. And she said, basically, they all say something along the lines of, I don't know where it comes from. Uh, it just comes through me, and I know that if I didn't do it, somebody else would. And that is 100% in keeping with what the pre-enlightenment view of uh, creativity was all about. The problem with the, the post-enlightenment view is that it becomes the property of an ego it becomes a more ego-driven thing. So you get artists who, are, who have gigantic e egos and probably not very nice people at all. Um, and uh, 
you know, that might not stop them from doing their art, but, uh, you know, they, they have the wrong perspective on it. I absolutely believe in my own modest way in the work that I've done in the past. There have been times when I have felt an idea coming towards me and uh, when it arrives, it's like a rush of wind and the idea says to me, you will do this, won't you? And uh, I say, yes, absolutely, I'll do it because it, you know, the, the sense of I've just been inspired felt so good that, you know, I'd, do, I'd agree to anything at that point. Uh, and that's what Liz Gilbert describes too. This is a common thing and uh, you know that it's working for you when that happens. Now, I'm not saying I'm particularly special in this regard. I've simply cultivated the ideas that I am telling you about here today. And uh, if it works for me, it'll work for you. Okay, so uh, where does it come from? There's this idea, really, that... Um, Okay, well, wind it back to the 50s and 60s, there was a French philosopher called Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. He was a little-known philosopher who wrote a book that was actually very influential on the development of the internet. The people who devised the early net, the protocols and everything around the Bay Area of San Francisco were influenced by de Chardin. He, you know, they acknowledge this. And he basically says, said that um, this world has got three planes to it. He said there is the inorganic plane, that's the rocks of the earth, that's that inorganic, lifeless part of the earth. Then there's the, he called that the geosphere. Then there's the biosphere, the sphere of life, and that's all of the abundant life that lives on this planet, the millions of species, the trillions of life forms, all together make up a biosphere. Then he says, above all of that is the noosphere, which in Greek means the level of mind. And his idea was that the biosphere, that the consciousness that existed in all of those life forms, not just humans, but all life, collectively formed this mind that surrounds the earth. Now, I know that it sounds all very, you know, I don't know <laughs> what you describe it as, but uh, it, it, it's not something you could prove, but it was an influential idea. And the, uh, the computer scientists back in the 60s and 70s, really took on this idea. And you could say that the internet as we now have it is an implementation of that idea. Now, it, it, it isn't necessarily the case that the net would not have come about had he not written that book, but uh, somebody else would have done it because it was a good idea whose time had come and it was going to happen regardless. You know, when you look at the history of innovation, the Wright brothers were not the only ones working on powered flight. There was a team in New Zealand working on it. There was a team somewhere else working on it. But the Wright brothers did it first and got the credit. Charles Darwin wasn't the only one who came up with the theory of evolution. Ed, uh, Edgar Wallace, no, not Edgar, Arthur. Alfred Wallace uh, also came up with it. Darwin got in first. The TV, I think I told you in an earlier lecture, is credited to an, uh, a Scots, Scottish guy, but uh, it was actually being worked on by... So these ideas float around out there somewhere. You, know, you don't have to believe in, in parapsychology or anything like that. You just have to look at the world as it is and how new knowledge comes into it. It does seem to come in from out there into the minds of people who then do something about it. Now, it, it's, it doesn't just talk to one person, it talks to multiple people, and uh, if somebody declines to do anything about it, well, that's okay, somebody else will. And uh, there's plenty of precedence for that. So, you know, the point I'm making here is that if you cultivate the right mindset, which is what I'm talking about here, 
you will then be in a fit state to receive those ideas. A bit like a radio being tuned to a certain frequency. It just seems to work that way. Um, so that's where inspiration comes from, or that's one explanation for where it comes from. Okay, so that list that you see on the screen there uh, is the consolidated essential list of creativity factors. And I'll just give you some information about each of them uh, in order to get you to, you know, get a feeling for it and, um, and maybe think about how to implement it in your own life. This first one, it's, it's kind of in order of importance, although they're all important. This first one is, by, is, is a very important factor. Productive versus reproductive. Now, that just simply means a creative person will think of new ways of doing things, whereas a, everybody else will simply recycle existing ways of doing things for which there is a precedent. Yes, we did it this way a year ago. Let's do it again this way now. That's efficient, isn't it? We, we don't have to think too much about that. We can just use a template and do that. But, of course, that reproduced way may not be the best way that that can be done. It probably isn't now. If the idea originally came from some time ago, the world has changed, there will be better ways of doing it. So the creative person understands that and thinks, well, I'm going to approach each situation from scratch. I'm going to think from first principles about each one and think, well, what is the best way of doing this? So, for example, when Steve Jobs had his bright idea of rolling three things into one package with the iPhone back in 2008, when it was released, you know, there was the iPod that had been around for a while where you could have thousands of uh, music files on there, that was unprecedented. There were music players, but you, you might get half a dozen songs onto it. Thousands. iPod, by far the best music player on the market at the time. Then, of course, there is uh, web surfing, accessing the internet. There were other ways of doing it then, but it was clunky. And, of course, there was a telephone in there as well. So what would happen if you then combined all three of those things into one sleek, sexy package? Well then, you know, it's history, isn't it? And what, what was released in 2008 has changed the world. It was a new paradigm. It's not like there weren't smartphones before that. There were plenty. There were at least three or four. There was Blackberry. There was Palm Pilot. There was... Uh, I forget, but um, basically they were clunky and um, people looked at the iPhone with its pop-up keyboard and its high-definition, high-colour screen and thought that is infinitely better than what is currently on the market. So that's an example of someone who approached the whole business of, well, what could a phone actually be? beyond what it already was. If he'd been lazy and thought, oh, we'll do something a lot, yeah, we'll do something a bit like a Palm Pilot, a bit like a Blackberry, but it'll be better than both of those things, but still basically the same type of product. See, that's reproductive thinking, whereas productive thinking came up with the new iPhone. Children are, by nature, productive thinkers. They can come up with lots more uses, lots more ideas than, a, than an adult. And uh, that's how I can be confident in saying to you that, you know, you are inherently creative. You may just have lost sight of that by means of the education system that you came up through. Hey, I'm not really, I'm a product of that system too. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think it leaves a bit to be desired, particularly when it says to people, don't, don't think too far out of the box. We want people who conform to the norm. Well, time, there are times you have to conform to the norm, but uh, other times it's better not to. That's the first point, perceiving the essence of the situation. I mentioned this in a previous lecture, uh, that... The ability to 
have penetrating insight into the true nature of things is absolutely fundamental here. Now, you don't have to be a clairvoyant or, or some sort of super brain to do this. You just need to spend long enough concentrating on the effort of doing this before it will happen. Most people aren't prepared to put in the effort. They look at something, they think they know what it means, and that's good enough. They'll proceed on that basis. But it probably isn't quite what it seems to be. So to look very in a penetrating way at what something really is all about. And then you do the same thing a second time and a third time and you bring those uh, insights together and combine them in a way that uh, has possibly never been done before. And I think I said last week how most of the time that's not going to produce anything earth-shattering. It might even be ridiculous what it comes up with, but that doesn't matter. It always, always, this is another thing that all creative people say, is that if I only knew which one of the efforts I do is the winner, and I could have saved myself the other 19 times that I did something where it wasn't a winner, but you never do. You, de you never actually know ahead of time which one is going to work. So you just do it over and over. And, uh, you know, that takes a bit of discipline in itself to keep trying when you, you know, think it's just one failure after another. People with insatiable curiosity, this is so fundamental. You look at children. Children are naturally curious. You know, you're in the super... <laughs> I don't know if you go to supermarkets, but I do. Uh, and you, you hear the conversations between children and their parents. And, uh, you know, most of the time, most of the time, they're saying... They, they basically just want information. They're curious about something. They want clarification. They want to be told. Sometimes they're saying, I want that, that chocolate. But other times, most of the time. And, uh, you know, it's appalling just how often... The parent either ignores them, tells them to be quiet, fobs them off, basically does not reward their curiosity. So people, over time, stop being curious. It's simply easier that way. You don't get, you don't earn the, um, you know, you don't get your parents angry at you. But of course, it is the essence of creativity because there's so much information out there. And the more of it you absorb, the better. Now, when that kid gets old enough to Google things on their smartphone, well, they can find out for themselves what's going on, but hopefully they haven't lost the uh, urge to be curious uh, when, you know, by that time. A funny thing happens. You know, I've always been really curious about everything, and... Uh, for years and years, all that knowledge just came into my brain and didn't really gel. It didn't really form any kind of coherent whole. And then in my 40s, it started to coalesce into a more or less coherent, unified body of knowledge. There were lots of gaps in it. Of course there was. It, it, the best analogy I can use is if you think of Star Wars, how the Death Star, you know, after it's been damaged, it is a sphere, it's obviously a sphere, but it's got chunks out of it, there's bits missing. It kind of reminds me of that. And once you reach that point, you have got a really good working knowledge of the world that you can use, you can apply in any number of ways. It's a it's a really fantastic tool to have. Now, I didn't realise that was going to happen. It just happened. It was spontaneous. So, you know, that's the result of insatiable curiosity over time. And, of course, it takes mental effort to be curious. It's easier to not be curious. You know, most of the opposite, fact, opposite of these factors is really an energy-conserving evolutionary trait. 
You know, we were chronically undernourished in the evolutionary environment, so it made sense not to expend energy unwisely, you know, when you didn't need to. So we, we kind of develop an uh, economy of effort approach to the world. But how different the world is now, you know, we are not chronically undernourished. And, uh, you know, you can consume enough, you have, to, you have to consume calories in order to uh, fuel your brain, which consumes something like 20 or 30 percent of your total body's energy budget burned up by your brain. So, you know, if you keep yourself well fueled and uh, you fuel your brain and you uh, maintain that curiosity, all sorts of things. And without really knowing why, you intuitively take an interest in certain things. And that's really good to follow, that intuitive prompting. You may not see a reason for it at the time, but I've found from experience it always pays dividends in the end. I can see a reason for all of those intuitive promptings. You just have to be open to listening to them. Externalizing your thinking. In this age, where we have unprecedented tools for externalizing our thinking, there is no better time to make prototypes of ideas. And that's how, that's how Silicon Valley does it. It's all about that develop, rapid prototyping using a disciplined, agile uh, approach to make something that is then tested and then reiteratively re improved and down the track, maybe 20, 20 iterations down the track. I mean, the iPhone didn't emerge fully firmed, formed. It was prototyped. And, uh, you know, Job's Jobs was, <laughs> somebody said in the comments that I, it annoys them that I pronounce it Job's, yes, probably should say Jobs, uh, was very strict about this. Uh, there's a, an account of a time where he wanted it to be super slim, you know, really small. And uh, he was reviewing a prototype from the engineers and he said, no, no, fellas, that's still too big. And uh, the engineers, as engineers do, would say, said, uh, well, that's as small as we can make it, Steve. Um, you know, there's, there's really no, no, no scope for anything smaller. So apparently Jobs then took the phone prototype, dropped it into a fish aquarium and pointed to the bubbles that were coming out of it and said, look at that, there's room in there, make it smaller. Now, he wasn't an easy guy to work for. You know, he was legendary for being difficult that way. But, uh, you know, he had a vision and he was paying everybody to realise that vision and, as it turned out, it was the right vision. So you won't always be liked for being a creative person, particularly if you are rigorous about how well your vision is, is, is brought to life. Uh, you know, but in the end, it may well be worth it. Externalizing your thinking. You know, people like uh, Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo and people like that back in the Renaissance are well known for being great painters. Uh, but most people don't realize that particularly da Vinci was an engineer as well. He was very good at externalizing his thinking in drawings and in models and in all sorts of things. And, you know, this is a great way to, to actually create stuff, is to externalise your ideas. And, of course, we've got so many tools now that some of them free, you know, CAD software, plan, planning software, that allows you to make prototypes quite easily. So use those. An av avalanche of productivity you know, they are un unstoppably productive uh, because they're filled with enthusiasm, basically. They've got ideas bubbling around and no sooner do they start working on one idea but another idea occurs to them and they think, oh, I better just finish this first one. I'll, I'll just put that one on the back burner for now. And so when they finish the first thing, they think, right, I'll go straight on to the second thing. You know, it's not hard work. They do it whether it was... You know, they do it because they really enjoy doing it and because 
it is satisfying to do. But again, it requires lots of energy to do this, and most people are not prepared to put in enough effort. And you can cultivate that, that sense of, well, no, you know, I, I, I get back what I put into things, so if I put a lot into it, potentially I'll get a lot out of it. Random selection and combination of ideas, that sort of links back to this one here, perceiving the essence. Uh, you basically come up with ideas and you just put them together in ways that have never been done before. <laughs> in, a, in a trivial sort of example uh, in the kitchen, there are people who, you know, combine all sorts of weird ingredients. You know, they'll put anchovies with peanut butter or, or uh, you know, marmalade with... Um, I don't know what, you know, but it's just some, and, and when you say it to someone, they say, oh, man, that's, that sounds disgusting. No one would eat that. And, yeah, most of the time you wouldn't want to eat it, but sometimes it is unexpectedly good. And sometimes it's so unexpectedly good that it becomes the basis of a whole new food um, craze or, or, or trend. And uh, you, you just, that person says, I just didn't know. You know, I try all sorts of things and uh, I think they're all a good idea, but that one, that particular one, was really very successful. And it, that principle works in every field, absolutely does. Random selection and combination of ideas. The point is, you don't go around telling people that you are doing this. You keep this to yourself because... Most people <laughs> will ridicule you for doing that. They'll think you're a bit odd. They don't understand what the creative method is all about. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't. Those same people will, uh, you know, later on say, well, that was a really good idea, you know. They don't understand how you got to that idea. And, in fact, there is a, um, a famous four-step four process for technology adoption. Uh, it was thought up by a British chemist called J.B. Haldane about 100 years ago. And uh, the first one is when, when the technology emerges, people say, that's ridiculous. That's a really stupid, dumb idea. Second one, second stage is, yes, well, it's still a stupid idea, but I can see it has some use. The third stage is, uh, well, yes, this has some use, but I'm really not interested in doing it myself. And the fourth stage is, I always said it was a good idea. You know, and people have got a really short memory for these things. New technologies are coming along all the time, and they're almost universally greeted with derision at the beginning. And it goes through those stages, and then after a while people say, I can't imagine living without that thing. You know, I'm not sure if I gave you this example in an earlier lecture, but let's say we wanted to solve unemployment by going back 100 years ago to the way uh, tunnels were dug. And let's say we, we, we want an extension to a tunnel in the city there, we want to put a train in. Let's hire a 1,000 blokes to, with picks and shovels and let's get them, put them to work. You know, that's 1,000 guys. That's, uh, you know, that's really good. But if you suggested doing that, you know, you can imagine people would say, that's a barbaric idea. Why would you even think to do that? We have machines to do that. But, you know, back when those steam shovels and those mechanised diggers were first invented, they were greeted with the same scepticism and derision as lots of things are today. So... You take, you play the long game here. Technology innovation has to go through those stages and the majority of people, probably 99% of people, are, are not going to see the big picture. They're just going to see the bit that's in front of them and they'll react accordingly. Every generation has problems with technology acceptance. You know, if you look at the news reports of previous generations about the impact of technology on society. 
you could probably copy and paste most of those articles today and they would be just as useful and they're, they're very similar to the ones currently being written. People forget. They just do. And, uh, you know, but if you know this and take that longer term view, you can then be the shepherd. You can then be the, the, the guide who brings new technology into the world and understand the, you know, difficulties perhaps that it will go through on the, on the way. So uh, that's juxtaposing the dissimilar. Oh, sorry, no, that's random selection. Juxtaposing uh, the dissimilar is an extension of that. It's basically taking things that are actually quite different from each other, you know, like peanut butter and anchovies. You don't think of them in the same terms. But you put them together, you don't know what's going to happen. In fact, you know, anything could happen. So you go out of your way to think of what dissimilar things you can juxtapose. You don't just juxtapose things in the same category. Lots of people do that. That's what most people do who could be bothered doing anything, is work from the same category. But uh, if you look to a completely different category and do that, so it is kind of a lonely pursuit in the sense that you're not going to get a lot of encouragement from people, but it's, you know, you auto-generate the satisfaction that you get from doing this sort of thing. You know, for example, take music. If you listen to, you know, there are just hundreds of genres of music nowadays. And, um, and uh, what was I going to say? Um, Yes, uh, with, with this idea of music, most music that you listen to is derivative of other music, even really talented artists, even the, some of the most talented artists are doing things that are quite similar to um, what other people have done. You know, yeah, why, not, why wouldn't it be like that? Because they've listened to music, it's gone in, it's bubbled around in the back, on the back burner and, uh, you know, it's come out in their unique way, but it still sounds quite similar to what other people have done. A good example there is J.S. Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach, is given credit for being a musical genius, and no doubt he was. But the fact is, he came from a musical family. There were literally more than a hundred other Bachs in his extended family and going back generations who were all musicians. And, and he basically was not just a musician himself, he was an aggregator. He listened to other people's stuff and he combined it down into... And that's what a lot of musicians do. So there are very few who've actually invented a new genre that's unlike anything. It would be pretty difficult to do today, but it's certainly possible unlike anything anyone else has done, very few. And that's because that point, juxtaposing the dissimilar, people just don't tend to do it. But if you consciously do it, then that's the fast track to coming up with some really interesting ideas. Incidentally, um, the subconscious mind is like a big old servo mechanism that you have. It will do whatever you basically tell it to do. If you instruct it to think of things like that and offer them up periodically, uh, then it will do that. It will go away and it will do it. And you won't be conscious of what it's doing. You know, we've all perhaps experienced the idea of you have a problem and some time later, uh, the solution presents itself. Well, that's the subconscious mind has produced that and then brought it to your conscious mind as a result. You know, you asked for this, here it is. So it's uncritical, it just does whatever it's told to do. So you have to be very careful about what you tell it to do. But, uh, you know, if you understand that it just does that, it might take a little time, but it does that, then you can... Um, mine the uh, subconscious, you can use it 
you can mine that uh, substrate to get good ideas. Contraries are complementary. In other words, opposites actually go together with each other. The uh, physicist Niels Bohr uh, famously said that it's the mark of a great intellect that can entertain two opposing ideas simultaneously. And what he was talking about was there is creative conflict between those ideas. This goes all the way back to ancient Greece. This idea that when you put these two things together and they argue it out with each other, the heat of that conflict burns away what's superfluous and leaves the truth behind. But it's a process that takes time and it's uncomfortable whilst it's happening. And uh, if a person can uh, entertain that, and again, it's just really about the willingness. The hardest part of this is cultivating the willingness to do it. It's not actually doing it so much as being prepared to do it because it's uncomfortable. And of course, most people, myself included, think I want a life that's got as little suffering in it as possible, so I'll shy away from that which makes me suffer and just do what makes me comfortable. But of course, I realise that if I did that all of the time, I'd never actually get anywhere much if I stayed in my comfort zone the whole time. So uh, random selection, uh, just uh, contraries are complementary. Metaphorical thinking. I hope I'm not getting too, too way out with all of this stuff, but uh, essentially with metaphorical thinking, the, it's a language that is inherent to our minds. It's not the same as the language we verbally use that I'm talking to you with now. It is, it is, it is a, an instinctive language that's installed in you and which is the language of your dreams, for example. And you can learn to interpret what metaphors actually mean. You know, it's a, it takes time and it takes a bit of effort, but if you can understand what your subconscious mind is telling you by way of dreams, then you're going to get a lot of interesting insights into what's going on in your life, for one thing, but also uh, creative ideas in the way that I was just talking about before. So metaphorical thinking. If you're not clear what that actually means, it's simply saying uh, that you are representing something concrete with a symbol and saying that the thing is the symbol. Well, it's not the symbol, it's just representative of the thing. And they may be quite dissimilar things, but, uh, you know, so, for example, the navy could be represented by an anchor, or maybe two anchors crossed like that. Now, an anchor is just a steel thing that, you know, exists. It doesn't necessarily mean a navy, but it can be a metaphor for the navy. And there are some, this is what Carl Jung talked about, archetypes. There are certain metaphors that are common, seem to be common to everybody. Uh, he called them archetypes. Anyway, uh, open to new directions. Now, that's a really interesting one. That's one of the hardest ones of all because as social creatures, we like to be popular, we like to be accepted, we like people to like us. And that leads to groupthink. That leads to conventional ways of thinking and orthodox ways of looking at the world, orthodox ways of doing things in the world. And as I mentioned previously, the problem with that is that the opinion leaders aren't always the right people to be influencing the direction. You know, I, without disparaging anybody, I go to meetings. I actually avoid going to meetings as much as I possibly can. But uh, when I do go to meetings, maybe half a dozen people there, uh, time and time again, I've witnessed people with good ideas. That's the quiet, introspective person down the end. It might be a woman. 
and she's, she's got a good idea and she says it and nobody pays any attention to it, then somebody up the other end of the, five minutes later says, hey, I've got an idea and he says the same thing. And everyone goes, hey, that's a great idea, mate. Yeah, we should do that. And I've seen that happen so many times. I look at the first person and they're just, you know, not looking very happy about the whole situation. And, uh, you know, in groupthink, you often get led in the wrong direction. And uh, so it's very good to, to transcend groupthink and think for yourself. Solitude and silence. I think it was Soren Kierkegaard, the philosopher, who made the comment that uh, truly creative people are people who enjoy solitude, enjoy thinking their own thoughts, and it's necessary. Because in the back of your mind, there's a little voice that talks to you, and that's the voice I'm listening to when I'm talking to you, uh, that you don't hear if there's a lot of noise going on around you. You need to be alone in order to hear that voice. And, uh, well, not always, but, you know, it, it helps. And, uh, and silence. And most creative people will tell you that, they, that this is the way they do it. They don't create with music playing. Or if they do, it's a certain special kind of music. That, uh, so solitude and silence operate outside of their comfort zone. That's fairly self-explanatory. There's an old saying that you will not grow as a person if you never leave your comfort zone. You, if, if you are going to grow, you have to take yourself out into the zone of uncertainty and uh, suffer the unpleasant consequences of not being quite sure what's going to happen next. Gratitude, it seems like an odd thing with creativity, I agree. It does look out of place there. But it's actually, um, it actually creates the space for ideas to come in. It's quite common for people in the world, I think it's always been common for people in the world to become accustomed to what it is they have. Uh, there's an evolutionary reason for that. We, we pay attention to what we don't have, not what we have. And uh, so no sooner do we get something good, we might enjoy it for a short time, then we just take it for granted. And, uh, you know, in our current society, we have an unprecedentedly high standard of living, safe world to live in, all sorts of advantages to living in this world compared to the world generations ago. Not that you would think so to watch TV, news, because, you know, they're always focusing on the bad things going on, but those are relatively rare compared to the many better things going on. But uh, essentially, people just get used to taking things for granted and complaining. People love to complain. So, you know, I've seen them in restaurants. People call the waiter over and be indignant. This. And you see, you know, the pain look on the waiter's face or the waitress. And, um, you know, that's not to say you don't have to put up with cold soup or something. You can ask them, sorry, this is cold. Could you take it away and heat it? It's not a grievance so much as a request and a reasonable one. But the thing about gratitude is to actually recognise that there are many advantages and those advantages you can leverage off and you're really just making them conscious. That's, that's all you're really doing when you think of gratitude. Now, this is, this is probably a personal thing to tell you, but, you know, I can tell you honestly that for the last 10 or 15 years, the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning and I get up is I think to myself, I'm really grateful for having another day of life. You know, not that I'm sick or expect to die anytime soon, hopefully. Um, no, but I think it's the best way to actually start the day is with a mindset of gratitude. And, you know, you'd be surprised at 
what good things flow from that, it certainly makes me more creative in my thinking. Uh, nearly there, non-attached to ideas, yes. We tend to think of our ideas as being pet things that, you know, you worked hard to make them and you don't want to let them go. When you write your essay, which I hope you are going to start writing fairly soon if you haven't actually started yet, but please do start. Um, you know, you write something like that, at the end of it, you might realise that that whole section there just doesn't fit. Sorry, it's just, you know, I've gone a slightly different direction. It doesn't fit anymore. Most people will say, ah, oh, but I just can't bring myself to take it out. I work so hard on it. But it's better if you do take it out. And, you know, creative people are perfectionists to the extent that if they can see something will be greatly improved by taking something out, then they will do it. And I know when I was writing my PhD, that was very much uppermost in my mind. I, you know, the thing that I wrote was probably half the number of words, the total number of words that I actually wrote, and I took the rest of it out. You know, I'd write something, I'd think, no, 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 take it out. They're not actually your children that you couldn't bear to be parted from. They are simply an artefact that was created and is a temporary thing. And uh, if it's better gone, then get rid of it. And finally, resilience. Again, people tend to take, take it as a sign from the cosmos that something was not meant to be. But, you know, if you are one of those people who combine ideas in unorthodox ways and juxtapose contraries and, you know, you've, you've done time after time of this ten times in a row and it's been a dud each time, some people would interpret that as a failure, but not the person doing it, because they're, they're really just seeing it as iterations in the creative process. And it calls for a fundamentally resilient mindset that instant success is never going to happen. It's most unusual that any great idea emerges fully formed out of chaos and brought into the world. It just doesn't happen. There's a tremendous amount of work goes into having the idea, then refining the idea, then bringing it up to a fully, to a fully uh, developed level. Okay, so those are the creative mindsets. And of course, in the notes is a lot more information, uh, which will hopefully help you to cultivate something akin to this. That's my method, is that I describe what the mindset looks like and I say, if you adopt this, you create the right conditions for it to happen in your case. But nobody knows when or how exactly it's going to happen. It'll be different for everybody. But you can create the right conditions. You cannot produce it on demand. So, totally... Uh, encourage you to do that. The IT industry is hungry for people with good ideas, believe me. To finish off today, I want to talk about uh, the ethical technologist. You know, uh, actually, what I'll do is I'll put this into perspective by showing you this quote from one of my favourite writers, John Steinbeck, American novelist who won a Nobel Prize for Literature for his book Grapes of Wrath. This is from another of his books, East of Eden. He, uh, he sums it up. I mean, basically, he is saying that the distinction between right and wrong, good and evil, is absolutely fundamental to the human condition. You know, down here he says, there is no other story. Someone, after they have brushed off the dust and chips of their life, will, have, will be left with only one hard, clean question. Was it good or was it evil? Have I done well or ill? And he's really talking about that deathbed, what people think about on their deathbeds. And, uh, you know... <laughs> So ethics is really about that. 
It's about the thinking about the ways to live that create the right conditions rather than the wrong conditions. And if I had to boil ethics down to a very simple idea, it would be this. The essence of ethics is to cultivate a conscious awareness of the cause and effect linkages between what you did in the past and what is happening in your life now. And there are linkages because we live in a cause and effect world. It didn't just happen out of nowhere. It was created through cause and that cause cr produces an effect and then that effect produces another effect, etc., etc. So once you've done that, you've raised yourself above every other creature on this planet in being able to consciously travel in time back to something that happened and see, yes, I don't like this situation I'm in right now and the causal link to that is this. I see it now. Three weeks ago I did this. I didn't see the connection at first, but I see it now. So I'm not going to do that again. That's the first part. The second part then is to consciously engineer what happens in your future by taking the right actions now. So it's really just an extrapolation on the first part, isn't it? It's really just saying, well, in a cause and effect world, I can create the conditions I want for myself if I do this now. Sometimes calls for delayed gratification. You may not be able to get the thing you want straight away. It might take some work. Often does. And some time. But that's, that's the reality of it. It's quite common in the world that people, have, we all know people that the same problems seem to keep reoccurring to them. You know, they find themselves in, a, in, in trouble and it's the same trouble each time. Yeah, different sort of, some differences, but it's the same basic thing. And that's because they're not seeing that cause and effect link. They don't realise that they could just step out of that, that sort of matrix, you know, like a red pill moment and, and just step out of it and say, oh, I just realised that I've been doing this to myself all this time. How, how silly of me, but I won't, you know, I'm not going to beat myself up. I'm simply going to decide not to do it anymore. Now, what that all calls for is a mindset of personal responsibility. Personal responsibility to basically say, whatever happens to me, almost whatever, <laughs> is something that I have caused to happen and I'm going to take responsibility for that. I'm not going to blame someone else. I'm not going to try and pass the blame off <coughs> and I'm not going to, I'm not going to cultivate a, a victim mentality because that basically takes all your power away. If you take responsibility, you empower yourself to do almost anything, anything you put your mind to do. So what better way then to put your creative mindset to good use if you've done this? Now, there's nothing very mysterious about anything I've just said. That's been well known in psychology for generations. There's really nothing new in it. And in fact, if you look at books like the Tao Te Ching, oldest book still in print today, written two and a half, three thousand years ago, says exactly that, basically. And uh, so it's not exactly a new idea, it's just an idea that many of us have lost sight of. Uh, so, you know, to finish, I will um, give you an example of this. It does take a bit of, it's tempting to not take responsibility. So, uh, back in the 80s, uh, I, I was travelling around in a camper van with my wife, and this was in England, and uh, the van was an old combi van that wasn't very reliable and every morning this van did not start, would not start. I had to roll start it every time. 
And after six weeks, I was so sick and tired and fed up with this damn thing not starting in the morning. It was really aggravating me. And uh, so I basically, every morning, I, I, I thought to myself, wouldn't it be great to just give this thing a boot up the ass and send it on, on its way? And, you know, I just thought that idly every morning. And then on the last morning, the very last morning, we were parked at the side of a busy motorway uh, in England, just near the ferry from the continent. And uh, I, I, I was saying to uh, my wife, I think it's going to start now. And before I got that sentence out, there was this cataclysmic explosion. We had been hit from behind by a speeding truck, probably doing about 80, 90 kilometres an hour. Driver had fallen asleep going down a hill. You know, where better to roll start a car? That's where we were parked. <coughs> and um, so basically, we accelerated from zero to 80, 90 in the space of a second or less. And, uh, you know, I mean, basically, afterwards, the police said, totally not your fault, 100% the driver of the truck. You know, not your fault. But, you know, I... I I thought to myself, but, you know, what happened was exactly what I had been thinking every morning for the previous, you know, and I said that to, I said that to people, I think I caused it by thinking that way. And they said, oh, no, don't do that to yourself, mate. Don't do it. You know, it's not your fault. But I'm sure it was. I'm, not fault. I mean, I'm sure I created the condition for that to happen. And, uh, you know, I, we weren't badly.